Uh, we are going to be starting a new topic, the two kinds of righteousness. Yeah, so this, this might seem like it's coming out of nowhere, but actually it, it, we were discussing it a, a fair bit in Lutheran devotional life uh, because the two kinds of righteousness is fundamentally an application of law and gospel. So we've actually been talking about it for quite some time in a whole bunch of the different sections that uh, I've been doing on Sunday mornings for the past year and a half. But I just haven't given it a name. Uh, so for Lutheran devotional life, the, the last unit that we're going through, you know, oratio prayer, meditatio meditation, tentatio temptation. Well, it was really essential to distinguish between the grace we receive through the word and sacrament that as we, as we pray, as we meditate, as we are attacked, we're constantly going back to the word and the sacraments, the, the source of God's grace for us. So we need to distinguish between that and our actions, because even though we're going back to the word, to the sacraments, it's not as though we're meriting grace for ourselves. And our own actions of going back to these things, those are what's important. That's how we get grace. But as we understand our relationship to God and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who's working with us and driving us to the Word and the sacraments. And it's God's action for us that places us within these things, which can give us grace, give us salvation. So, um, although we are actively performing actions in the faith, uh, grace is given to us passively. So we're not the ones achieving grace. Grace is given to us quite freely from God. And this is how it was at the moment that we were converted as well. It's not that we went out seeking God, but that God first sought us, that the message of, God, of the gospel came to us um, through, through preaching of the word or through baptism itself, if we were, if we were converted at infants. And we were brought into the faith completely by God's own action. Our development within the faith is instigated by God, and we basically go along with it. Uh, <clears throat> so the whole of the Christian life actually reflects the concept uh, of, of the two kinds of righteousness. And this is also built on God's law, that is, God's commands and our responses, that realm of the law. And it's also built on gospel, so God's free gift of salvation. So what God does for us, and, and usually in, yeah, if, if you want Sunday school or confirmation answers, the law is what we do, the gospel is what God does. Or the law, this is SLS, the law shows our sins, the gospel shows our Savior. Again, so what we do, what God does, law of God. A particular application of law and gospel within the life of and status of, of the Christian is the two kinds of righteousness, which operate as basically one being one side of one one kind of righteousness being purely gospel, the other kind being of the law, but of the law extending from that gospel message. I talked about this a few different times, but if if you remember the few different times, especially as there's scattered throughout everything else I was talking about over the past year and a half. Well, I don't expect you to remember everything. I don't. <laughs> but this is actually a very interesting concept and uh, one from that Robert Cole, Charles Aran talk about. This is the genius of Luther's theology. Man, this is a good book. <laughs> um, if, if the elders were ever interested in it, I would actually like to leave them kind of through a study in, in this book, but this is not necessarily the easiest read. This is getting on the border of academics. So if, if you think, if you want to challenge yourself a little bit, I definitely recommend The Genius of Luther Theology. I've recommended to many, many people. And one of the core tenets of the book is understanding Luther's theology within the two kinds of righteousness and, and showing how his entire theology is defined by the two kinds of righteousness. Good book. Good book. Is that by new or when did it come out? It, 
it, it's relatively new. So uh, 2008, 2008. So it's not quite new anymore, but it's it's still pretty recent. Um, so what is righteousness? If we're talking about the two kinds of righteousness, what is righteousness? Being in a right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. In our, uh, and I guess in the other will be um, obeying the law. Yeah, that, that's basically it. <laughs> mm -hmm. so it, it. Righteousness itself is actually one of the core concepts in the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. So I was trying to research the number of occurrences in scripture of all the words, but couldn't really find really good resources. And I'd have to go across a whole bunch of different words because these are word groups for righteousness in, the Old Testament, in Hebrew and in Greek. In the Old Testament, I was actually able to do this fairly well. So there's um, variations, the, the various different types of words, 600 occurrences in the Old Testament. And I would guess around the same number in the New Testament, even though the New Testament's about a third the size. So, major mean, concept. Did they mean the same thing in the Old Testament as in the New Testament? Actually, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, when I was doing a little bit of the research on this the other day, uh, what, they're, what, what the New Testament writers were doing was they were trying to base themselves off of uh, the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament scripture. So whenever you will have the word righteousness appear in the Greek in the, in the Septuagint, that's how they're bringing it forth into the New Testament. And the term for righteousness for the New Testament writers is worlds away from the Greek understanding of this word. Because if, if we're talking about righteousness, well, this is just of a minor matter to the Greeks at the time. They're more concerned with something called virtue flaw, uh, virtue ethics. So they're saying this is this is how you get acclamation from your peers. So what do you do that everybody thinks is good? That's what you do. Whereas righteousness is actually an appeal to a standard or rule, or obeying the law, basically. So for them, yeah, righteousness is part of virtue. Where you're obeying the law, you're doing what's good for society, you're, you're not getting into trouble. But that's just part of the, their greater understanding of virtue ethics, where you're trying to be the best you can be. And if you want the great, the great standards of virtue ethics, read the Iliad and Odyssey. Because the Homeric heroes there, so you have, uh, as you could say, Achilles, Hector. Uh, I hesitate to say Odysseus, but he's actually supposed to be paragon of virtue there, even though he's doing ver some very wicked stuff, condemnable stuff, according to our standards. Mm. These people are considered the greatest because they're able to overcome foes and they're able to be a pinnacle society. Uh, it, it's only when people start deviating from that they're that particular standard that people uh, that they're seen as unvirtuous, lacking in virtue. Mm -hmm. So if you say something for the Iliad, uh, it opens up with the wrath of Achilles. So Achilles is the main figure, and he's originally ticked off at Agamemnon because Agamemnon did something unvirtuous by taking a prize of war away from Achilles. Mm -hmm. Uh, namely a priestess that Achilles wants to um, have relations with. And we would say, well, that's a war, war slave that you're using for sexual purposes. So we would see that as not terribly virtuous, but that was supposed to be virtuous at the time. And Agamemnon taking her away, well, yeah, we would condemn that too because he's trying to keep her for himself. Even though Agamemnon's actually married and he should not be doing that anyway, which is something that uh, the Greeks also kind of frown on. But <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and because that's also something the Greeks are kind of trying on, that's why Agamemnon is, is more or less condemned. Um, also why his wife kills him when he gets home. Quite literally. But if we're looking at righteousness, our understanding of righteousness, well, this is going according to a more or stringent law, more, a higher law, because it's not how do we get the approval of our peers, but we're trying to concentrate to getting the approval of just one God, God. Because if righteousness is the appeal to a standard or a rule, well, whose standard or rule is it? The guy over everything. So if you have the Greeks and they're trying to get the approval of others with their virtues, well, you could get a whole bunch of standards because the standards of society change over time. So what was considered virtuous at the time of Homer when he's writing the Iliad and Odyssey is not necessarily uh, something virtuous at the time of Plato about 300 years later, a little bit more than that. And Plato, actually, part of his writings is just railing against Homer because Homer is depicting the gods in unvirtuous ways. Just, like, just read half the stories about Zeus. It's, it's not good. So Plato really rejects a lot of that. And Plato is arguing, well, those, those virtuous standards at that time can't, can't be uh, good or accurate. So Plato will argue for a new standard of virtue. Uh, Aristotle comes immediately after Plato, and then he also wants to be standard virtue. Uh, pretty close to Plato's, but still a little bit different. And uh, Aristotle's, Aristotle's standards of virtue become basically the, the mainstay for uh, medieval ethics. But that's something Luther really hates, actually, <laughs> is, is uh, Aristotle's understanding of ethics. He's using all the definitions before Plato. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when Luther is actually trying to bring forth the concept of righteousness in his own, well, I wouldn't say his own theology, but a, a biblical theology, uh, Luther will greatly condemn Aristotle's virtue ethics. Luther will definitely accept Aristotle's understanding of logic because we use that same standard today and it, 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 it's good. But if we're understanding the ethics, well, they're somewhat corrupt. Even if they've come through a Christian filter uh, through the medieval period. That was one of Thomas Aquinas. He's, he's one of the pillars of Christian ethics. And he his great mission was adapting Aristotle to Christianity. That was, that was one of his main goals of his principal works. Sorry, a lot of history, a lot of philosophy. Basically, uh, when we're looking at what do what do the Greeks, what do the Hebrews think is virtuous, they're in different parts, uh, different worlds almost. And if we're looking at righteousness in scripture, it, it appeals to the single standard of God. Which is good because we have a great high standard above all of us, mm -hmm. but it can actually be very frightening because this standard is defined now by God perfection. You are now only righteous if you are perfect. <laughs> I know that's one of the things. Um, so, 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 how did how did they try to understand this? The, the 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 Hebrews. Well, they they understood this, especially at the time of Jesus, as trying to do the law. God gave the law to Moses. This is coming from God Himself. This is part of God's essence that He is giving this law to set. Uh, all people on this standard. So the Jews decide we're going to do this law. And they go for it and they, they assume that they do it. Did they actually do it? No. <laughs> uh, and, and this is uh, one of Jesus' main points in Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Coincidentally, where he also says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So perfection is your standard. And he's also saying, well, it's not enough not to murder, but you also have to not act, not even think in hatred. It's not enough not to commit adultery. You can even lust. So Jesus really says, if you're if you're understanding the Old Testament law, then you understand that it goes far deeper, far far deeper. So it's not just 
the actions that you perform towards others, it's the core of your heart. Now, of course, this, that's all over the place in the Old Testament scriptures, but when you get to the Pharisees, they're more concerned about actions, or at least a lot of them are more concerned about actions. Well, with this, <clears throat> we also understand that you are righteous, not because you are prosperous, not because you have great social status, not because of X, Y, Z. Um, if, if you want to see people misunderstand this, just look at Job's friends. Because basically they're saying, Job, you have to be in the right relationship with God. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's the standard of righteousness. That's the standard of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then they go, instead of because then you'll be with God and he'll love you and all, all that, usually what we preach on Sundays, the friends go, because you'll get all this stuff. And everybody will like you again. And that's actually a shifting more towards virtue ethics, where it's you get all the good stuff. You get approval of everybody. But that, that's not where, where we want to go. We actually want to go with being in the right relationship with God, which actually means we're in its perfection and we're being perfect. And if we start deviating towards prosperity and social status, then you're doing exactly what God forbids us to do. Because when God is giving us his law, he also says that he's impartial, therefore we're impartial. Whether somebody's rich or poor, if they're a slave or free, doesn't matter. You're impartial, you're judging them fairly. So if you give favor to somebody who's poor, don't do that. If you give favor to somebody who's rich, don't do that. Just judge them based on what has happened. And because, uh, yeah, so this is linked to God, so God's perfection, there is no upper limit. Mm -hmm. So when the Jews are very happy, oh, I haven't murdered anybody today, I haven't committed adultery today, I haven't stolen anything, and they go, okay, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't mean that you actually fulfill righteousness. There's no upper limit. You can, you can still sell all your things, give them to the poor instead of just not stealing. You could give, give your buddies relationship advice to make sure that even though your relationship is okay, maybe there's no, their relationships aren't. So you give them re relationship advice to help them out. Um, it's not enough just for you to not kill people, but you should also help people. They may be aching, they may be in pain. So can you help them out? Can you lend them a hand? So do more, do more, do more, do more, do more. And, and that's also the message of the law, God's law, is be perfect, which means you are perfect as God is perfect, and as God is supplying everybody's needs, so you too must supply everyone's needs and take care of everyone. Oh, sorry, were you going to say something? Well, I'm struggling with how to put it in words, but Let's say you have a fellow who is following all the commandments. Mm -hmm. You say he didn't kill anybody, he didn't have an obvious thing. But that alone is not enough. He, mm -hmm. The guy may be thinking of doing it, but he didn't. You know? mm -hmm. So before the law, he has been behaving all right, but mentally, ha -ha, he was planning something pretty bad. So mm -hmm. if you include that the Ten Commandments not only prescribe that you must not do that and now enlarge it to you must not even think about it mm -hmm. then you are up the click you know yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you can say that <laughs> yeah and, and that's moving into not just actions but your very being in front of god the, the yeah. core of yourself uh you could say the heart because if we recognize that sin is unrighteousness, um, fundamentally your righteousness is an initial division from God, and that is by definition sin. So you're brought again away from God's standard, away from his protection, that's it. So just by existing apart from God, even though you might be doing I, again, like fulfilling those commandments of the law, not stealing, not dishonoring your parents, not murdering a lot. Uh, 
if you're doing that apart from God, apart from his perfection, then you're not actually fulfilling righteousness. Which basically translates into you, even though you might be fulfilling the second table of the law towards other people, you still have to fulfill the first table of the law. You shall have no other God. There's only one person you answer to. Well, you answer to many people because of the fourth commandment, but one person you ultimately answer to. Yep. Given that um, Adam and Eve committed the very first sin, mm. and we are punished right down to the end of mankind, there is no way out. <laughs> no. Yeah, so if we're, if we're talking about righteousness, we're talking about an extremely high standard. And bringing Luther into all of this, because two kinds of righteousness is, is, is a very Lutheran concept, because it's also stemming from our understanding, our distinction between law and gospel. So, of course, this is how we phrase things. Uh, Luther had an extremely hard time from this uh, as a monk, because he's trying to be as righteous, as perfect as he possibly can, and he can't. And the monasteries have a different way of going about things than the Pharisees. The Pharisees added on a whole bunch of extra laws. Uh, the monasteries, what they tried to do was they tried to impose uh, fasting, um, self chastisement. Self -chastisement. <laughs> yeah, so you get get a whole bunch of nettles, start whipping yourself. Uh -huh. <laughs> But all of this is basically to try and curb yourself towards proper righteousness, which is God's perfection. But it doesn't help anybody else when you can't negate yourself. You know? No. And that's that's one of the things that Luther eventually came to realize is there's no way that he could actually make himself perfect before God. And nobody can make himself perfect because of the law. Uh, the law is the standard, and if you don't fulfill it perfectly on day one through day of infinity, then you're lost. That's just it. Well, I mean, you can try, you can be seen as fulfilling all the requirements of the law, but it still doesn't make you a good person if you have not hmm. Anybody or whatever, you know? Well, no, because because that's still uh, the requirements of the law, but in a little bit more of an implicit sense. Because if you're looking at the Ten Commandments, you're saying don't murder, but and a lot of them are prohibition. But if you actually understand the spirit of the law, capital S spirit, mm -hmm. the spirit of the law is actually living as God would live towards these people, which means you are now giving to them as God would give to them. Or you can even you can even use Jesus saying there is no greater love than a man should give his life for his friends. Sure. So the greatest love, the greatest fulfillment of the law is you sacrifice yourself entirely for the lives of others. And if you have, say, a movie stub, and that that's kind of going back ways, everything's digital now. But back when you had movie stubs. <laughs> And you took a couple hours out of the day to watch a movie and try to enjoy yourself. Well, that's two hours you could have spent in a super <laughs> soup kitchen doling that out and trying to help people. So how dare you who do that instead of well, likewise, yeah. a lot of people can do a lot of good things and be seen as a good person. Yeah. But if they don't have a relationship with God, like, well, well, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean it works the other way too, right? Exactly. And this is this is now getting into the two kinds of righteousness where we're splitting righteousness before God and righteousness before other people. Yeah. Yeah. Because people can see you doing a whole bunch of righteous things, and this may conform to their standard. I mean, like with even with the whole virtue ethics thing, like you were trying to conform to the standard of the day. You can be as righteous as you can there, but still fail to be righteous in front of God. So we actually recognize that there are two different understandings of how righteousness can act, mm -hmm. and some of it's acceptable, as you would say, before the world, mm -hmm. and there's another kind of righteousness acceptable only before God. Now, the righteousness before the world is actually still under the righteousness of God, but it's seen in a completely different light if we understand we can't perfectly fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Because we can, we can meet the standard of the world, and still not be righteous. And still not be righteous. 
because that, that was basically what the Pharisees were doing. Like, did they meet the standards of the world? Oh yeah, they went way beyond it. They were they were the greatest. Uh, uh, the, yeah, they were the greatest believers of their day because they kept doing stuff even beyond the law. This is why Jesus is trying to confront them all the time because they're the greatest standard. And if Jesus can show the hypocrisy in the greatest standard of the time, then nobody's perfect in front of God. So even though they were the best of the best, they weren't good enough. And that's why Jesus is pointing them instead of works of the law, instead of trying to do your best under the law, which no person can do, point them towards grace. Mm -hmm. And now this is going to be righteousness before God. Because the righteousness before God is not something that we can achieve, especially not by the law, but it's something that God gives to us. And that was Luther's profound epiphany uh, and, and how, how he would phrase him coming into the faith. But uh, uh, as, as I've been told by different Lutheran theologians, you already saw, you could already see this like years and years before Luther made his grand epiphany in his writings on the Psalms. But his great epiphany was actually reading uh, Romans 1 17. And we're gonna be, for, for the rest of, rest of our talks about the two kinds of righteousness, we're basically gonna be walking through the book of Romans. But this is this is coming from Romans 1 17, where Paul has a thesis statement for the book, which is the righteous shall live by faith. And this terrified Luther because according to the standards of his day, where you have an emphasis on works of the law or, or love under the law from the Roman Catholic Church saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. Also in the monastery, you have to do this, you have to do that. And if you can't, then mute, then hurt yourself or, or fast. Well, Luther's not getting any better. So if he's, if he's faithful and he's still committing sins, then he's not righteous. So this is absolutely terrifying because if he's, if he's not perfectly righteous, does he really have faith? And that's a crisis for many Christians, even nowadays, because especially in the churches that are emphasizing works, which is, am I actually good enough to be counted as somebody in the faith? Right. Right. And when uh, and those churches can be greatly successful because sometimes you just have a checklist if you do that, this, this that, and the other thing, you're good. Um, and that's usually more of a uh, evangelical theology that you have to do all these things. And then you're good, but you could also apply that to the Roman Catholic Church a little bit, who, who also focus a little bit on works, or well, maybe more than a little bit. But uh, for them, if you go to mass at least once a year, then then you're maintaining your salvation. So you go to you go to mass every Easter or every Christmas, and you go. You don't necessarily have to show up any other time, but you you meet the bare minimum and and, and that. That, that's not what the Roman Catholic Church wants to do. They don't want you to come in just for the bare minimum. But this is how some people understand. May I ask a question? Oh, sure. So, um, uh, a comment I was going to make was about righteousness by faith, right? You, yeah. You're concerned about relationship with mm -hmm. God, and you mm -hmm. know that you never can do enough, but you know judgment's coming. Yes. What are they judging you? On the degrees of faith you have? Actually, on your works. And, and we're going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, so that's why you say you, you, you use examples of churches that stress the law, yeah. right? right? The, the works, or, mm. yeah, I don't know if that's law, law but they use yeah. that as a way of getting them correcting their behavior. Mm -hmm. But don't we do the same thing because we know judgment's coming? No, okay. no, actually. And we're going to. I think a lot of people live under fear of judgment. Yes, yes, so, absolutely. You know, so you know it's coming. So even if you feel like you live, you know, in a right relationship with God, mm. is it going to be enough? When judgment yeah. comes? That's the haunting question. That's, that's the haunting question that everybody, every every person I think has. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, so we're still under the fear of the, of the law. Yeah. And 
we're, we're going to be getting into a lot of that when we start getting into Romans in the following weeks. Um, but when we're actually looking at this and understanding the righteous shall live by faith, what does this really mean? We actually have to shift our understanding because if we're looking at the righteous, those who are living by a particular standard, are living by faith. Well, am I righteous enough? Have I done enough? Well, this is actually the second part of righteousness, not a righteousness before God, but a righteousness before the world. Am I good enough? Am I meeting my own standard? Am I able to fulfill the law perfectly? And if our answer to that question is always no, then why would we evaluate ourselves based solely on that? So Luther, his great epiphany was rereading this in the correct light, which is those who are made righteous, those who have been made righteous by God and are righteous before him, they are those who actually live in and by their faith. Mm -hmm. So on one side, there's possible terror. There really is. Like some, some Christians, if they mean like all the, the checklists of what they have to do, yeah, sure, they're, they're fine. They don't have any judgment, uh, any, um, any fear. But the people you meet who are burned out in those churches, they're the ones who are going, I can't do anymore. I can't think anymore. I'm always going to find sin or unbelief somewhere. So I'm just going to end it all here and just move away from, from this group. And again, it, it's, it's just burnout from them trying to fulfill the law. And since we know we can't do it, if they really dive headlong into fulfilling the law, they're just going to get burned. The only source of salvation is where we always said it is, which is God's grace to us, a free gift of the gospel. So if we're righteous before God and we can be judged righteous on the last day, and we've already failed the law, then it's not only our works that are being judged, but Christ works for us. And that's going to be the interesting thing, is that we are actually being, we have been clothed with Christ in baptism. We will be clothed with Christ on the last day when we're raised from our graves. So when we're being evaluated by our judge, Jesus, he's going to see his own perfect and just works in us and see that we have achieved righteousness in the faith, which is his perfection. Not because of anything we have done, but what Christ has done for us. And that's the freedom that we actually have in the two kinds of righteousness, which is recognizing, yes, we have to do works of the law. We should be doing works of the law. This is something that's of God's own essence. But we're not only being judged by that setting. We're being judged by a completely, uh, 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 what we could even say, alien righteousness. And that's a phrase that comes up in certain Lutheran theologians. It's an alien in the sense that it's outside of us. It's not our righteousness, but a righteousness that is placed on us. But you're supposed to be trying. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just say, well, I don't know, good on the <laughs> I don't know, yeah, that, that would be um, kind of the example with if, if a nominal Roman Catholic, not saying that they're that they actually have faith, but the nominal Roman Catholic who goes to the mass once a year and goes, okay, I'm good now, that, that's fine. Sure, you met the bare minimum, but are you actually living by faith? Mm -hmm. And some people who are actually doing that, um, and I'll use the example of Job and Fr So the, Job, the French were saying, this is the standard that you have to apply to and then you get all this good stuff. If Job had complied to the friends, admitted some made up sin so that uh, he, would, he would get the approval of them, then he's not actually living by faith. He's, he's just going along with whatever to be righteous in the world. He's not, he's not trying to be righteous for God. So he would recognize God, who God is, God's power, but he's not going according to God's will, but according to human will. That would be Job's false will for Deny, uh, admitting a made up sin so that he could save himself and getting approval from the friends. And for Job, that means if he's actually to be truly righteous, he has to be called unrighteous by his friends, called a sinner by his friends, live in tension with God, whom he can't speak face to face, at least not for the majority of the book, 
and live in this tension, live in this, uh, uh, well, in fact, Pentatio, the temptations that, we've, that I was talking about uh, in, in the previous unit, uh, that you're experiencing a lot of attacks in this world, but also hoping and trusting that God will deliver you through them. It's not an easy task by any means, but it, it's one that we're called to do in order for us to actually live according to God's standard of righteousness. Okay. Any any closing comments, questions before we wrap up? Uh, if we come back to the very first uh, question, what is meant by the term righteousness? Is it safe to say if we are living a God pleading life? Mm -hmm. That cover it or I'm fishing for a definition that is acceptable to Christian thinking, but we end up with just two righteousnesses. Exactly. You know? <laughs> because it, even to that question, living a God pleasing life, well, what does that mean? Well, it's living a God pleasing life is a life that God has made pleasing to himself. But it's also not based on works. So, so His grace is given not based on works, but a God pleasing life is also one that is lived in accordance with the laws. The, 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 the commandments and yes, the, yeah. And for this, for us as as Christ, for us as Lutherans, this is why we place such a huge emphasis on a proper distinction between law and gospel. Because we recognize that, yes, we have to do the law. God has given us the law. It is good and perfect because it's coming from God himself. But we are not righteous based on the law or works of the law. We are righteous because God makes us righteous. So the God-pleasing life is one that God has made pleasing to himself. But now he has made you pleasing to himself. Go do the law. Sometimes. Historically, Lutheran Church has forgotten that last statement, and we've yeah, become fair enough. lazy in grace. No, yes. That. Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, one of the most recognized Lutheran theolo uh, theologians, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, oh, one one of his phrases was, "I don't want cheap grace." Yes. And what he was really talking about was a grace received freely from God, but not lived out. So it's, oh my, grace is costly because it costs the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if we treat it cheaply by not holding that up to be the, the great standard that we have to live up to, well, then we're treating it as if it's, it's extremely cheap. So we don't want cheap grace. We want grace living through us towards God and towards neighbor. Which is going back to his example of a uh, Roman Catholic going for their vaccination shots and saying, okay, they have salvation because they went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they went to mass one day a year. That's yeah. cheaper. Yeah. You know, and yeah, it should be reflected in mm -hmm. the if you take it seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's pray and, and we'll have. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for coming into this world and to give and give us to, to give us the grace that we live by day to day. Thank you, O Lord, for making us perfect in the Father's sight so that we may live unto eternity. We ask you, O Lord, for direction in our lives so that we may do what is pleasing to our Father in heaven and is and what is good towards our neighbors here on earth. Guide us in our thoughts and actions that we may live perfectly in this world and do what is needed of us. In your name, O Lord Jesus Christ, amen.